All right, in this video, I'm going to continue creating my NES sound chip recreation thing project, whatever, by adding some bells and whistles to my rectangular oscillator. So far, this is a monophonic synth. It uses a rectangular oscillator. It takes in the notes from my MIDI controller, and by using poly, it gives the right frequencies, turns them into audio signals, feeds it to my oscillator, and then plays it out from my speaker or from my headphones. Now I want to investigate two things. First of all, I want to change something that is called the pulse width, or in the case of Max, it is called, I believe, the duty cycle, the second inlet of Rect. What does it do? What does it change? We will find out in this video. And also I want to add a vibrato function. I want to make it so the sound kind of wobbles. It does it wow, 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 kind of sound. I want to be able to change its speed. I want to be able to change its depth. And I want to control all of these by using these knobs on my MIDI controller. So let's begin with the simple one. Let's change the duty cycle. Now you can see the duty cycle inlet, the second inlet accepts either an audio signal or a floating point number. I know from experience this is supposed to be between zero and one. But before all of that, I suppose the main question is, what is a duty cycle? Or what is a pulse width? What exactly am I changing here? To understand this, let's try and visualize these audio signals. Let's visualize our rectangular sound wave. I'm going to do this by using the scope object and I'm going to give it the attribute of automatic one so that it, it has an easier time showing us the visual sides of things. Even though I'm not playing anything right now, uh, the note off function here cuts it off, it multiplies it by zero after Rect sends out the audio signal. So if I use this, I'm still able to see the shape of the sound wave. If I connect it here, for instance, I would not see anything because this would be multiplied by zero now. I would only see these sound waves if I am playing something. But for convenience's sake, I just want to be able to see it like this. And if we look at it, you can immediately see why this is called a rectangular wave or a pulse wave, because, well, it looks like a rectangle. And these sound waves work in a very specific format. This middle line here is the zero point and the sound wave deviates from the zero point, right? So it goes above the zero point that usually goes up to one. In this case, it goes up to 0 0.6 and then it goes below the zero point. So it oscillates, oscillates between zero and one and then back to zero and then minus one. There is an oscillation between minus one and plus one. Now look at what happens if I plug in a floating point number box, I connect it to rect and I change this to let's say 0 0.2. Oops, not 2, but 0 0.2, there we go. Its shape changes. When I change this value, if I change it between 0 and 1, it kind of shifts a bit, right? And if I go above 1, it gets all wacky if I go below zero I believe it's also going to get very wacky this is not something we want we want this to be between zero and one well or 0 0.1 and 0 0.9 but what is happening is we are telling the oscillator how much of its time it should spend below the zero point so think of it like this if I type in 0 0.5 I'm telling the oscillator spend 50 percent of your time below the zero point make it so that the sound wave spends 50% of its time below the zero point. If I type in 0 0.2, it spends 20% of its time below the zero point and 80% of its time above the zero point. This changes the shape of the sound wave. It also changes, of course, the harmonics, the timbral makeup of the sound. So look how it sounds when I play the oscillator, when I play the synth and I change these values in real time. At some point it even sounds sawtooth like it's a very sharp sound but just by changing this duty cycle just by changing this pulse width it's possible to get so many different kinds of sounds and normally the NES sound chip has a few settings for the duty cycle if I remember right it's uh, 
0 0.25, 0 0.45, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. But since we have this nice MIDI controller, since we have this nice dial here, I want to be able to change it more freely. I'm going to cheat here. From now on, this is not an official recreation of the NES sound chip, but let's try to get some of that input in our oscillator. So just like how we use note in to get note values from our MIDI controller, we are going to use a similar object, CTLN, short for control N, it's going to receive MIDI control values. MIDI control values are sent whenever I change a knob or if I have a slider on my MIDI controller, this object is going to report the values that are being sent. And let's visualize what is going on. I'm going to put in three integer number boxes. And then, since by default this object reports all connected MIDI devices, I'm just going to fiddle around with these knobs. Okay, so obviously the first outlet sends out the controller value and surprise, surprise, it is between 0 and 127. The second outlet sends out a controller number. In this case, all of them seem to be 7 in the case of this MIDI controller that I'm using right now. And the third outlet is a MIDI channel and that is unique to each dial. Each knob sends out a different MIDI channel so I can use this to target a specific knob. Now I can simply get the value from here, turn it you know, into a range of 0 to 1 and plug it in to the second inlet of Rect, but I want to do something more sophisticated because if I do it like this, then all of the knobs are going to change it. And I want it so that only the first knob changes that value so that I can use the other knobs for other purposes. There's a very quick, very efficient way to do this, and that is with the power of arguments. If I create a CTLN and if I give it the argument 7, 1, because remember, my MIDI controller sends out a controller number of 7 and the MIDI channel of 1 if I'm using the first knob. Giving these as arguments to CTLN is going to report only that knob's information. If I use anything else, it is not going to report anything. I can also make copies of this guy right here. I can change the second argument to 2 and 3. And here we go, I'm receiving information from different knobs. Very easy, very efficient. So let's use the very first knob, this information, to control the pulse width. Of course, I don't want to go between 0 and 127, so obviously I need to scale this. So I, the incoming range of the numbers is 0 to 127. I'm putting in that dot, that decimal dot there, so that the output is a float. That is very important because I want a number between 0 and 1. So I can do this and I can visualize the results like this. And here we go. And now this knob is giving me a number between 0 and 1. And then all I have to do is to plug it here. And there we go, now it is changing in real time. The sound, the pulse width of the oscillator. Whoa, but it still does get pretty nuts if I go above 0.9 or 0.99. Well, the point is I don't want to go too high or too low, even though I'm giving a range between zero and one. So I'm just going to add a clip here. It's going to clip the incoming numbers and I want to clip it between 0 0.1 and 0 0.9, which means I will never go below 0 0.1 or above 0 0.9, even though this knob is giving me that value. Awesome, so this is really fun to play around with and it is crazy what kind of sounds you can generate just from a single oscillator. Okay, I guess it's kind of moving, it's kind of floating, right? I think that has to do with the frequency of the note that is being played right now. Hm, that was indeed weird. But all right, let's get back to the topic at hand. Now let's try and add a vibrato function to our synth. And there is a reason 
I use this sig tilde object here. I could have taken this frequency, right? I could have simply sent it to my rectangular oscillator. I could have simply sent it direct and it would have sent out, it would have been the same thing. It would have the same result. But I turned into, I converted it into an audio signal because I want to create a vibrato. And remember, vibrato is pretty much a cyclic variation in the frequency of an oscillator, right? So I just want to have a base frequency and I want to go up and down that frequency by a certain amount at a certain rhythm. So for this, I'm going to use a sine wave. The quintessential sine of sine wave object in MSP is of course cycle, cycle tilde, and then I have to put in a frequency, right? So let's say I want a frequency of one, and I'm going to visualize this in another way. I'm going to use live.scope. Live.scope is fairly new, I believe. I think it's one of the latest updates of Max 8. So if you don't have live scope, make sure to update your Max or make sure you have the right version of Max. I like to visualize the sine wave using live.scope because it kind of shows it over time. It shows the evolution of the sound wave in a way. And if I plug the cycle one into an audio output, I wouldn't hear anything because my ears aren't that good. No human's ears are that good to be able to hear an oscillation of one, a frequency of one. Our ears usually start hearing things from, uh, I think around 20, 20-ish, 20 and it goes all the way up to 20,000. But the thing is, I don't want to use this to, I, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this sine wave. What I want to do is to modulate the frequency by this amount. So think of it like this. If I use the plus operator, right, plus tilde, so I'm adding up two audio signals. And I put my signal here, I put the cycle here. And now when there is a certain, when there is a specific frequency coming, it is constantly adding and subtracting values depending on what is being generated from cycle. And just like a rectangular oscillator, this sine wave is going to go between minus one and plus one. So I'm constantly adding minus one, plus one, zero, minus one, zero, plus one, zero. So I'm creating this oscillation in the frequency. However, I believe if I try to play something now, it is not really going to sound very good. I mean, it sounds good, but there is no vibrato, is there? I mean, if there is, I can't hear it. And that is because right now the vibrato is very subtle. Remember this cycle, the sine wave goes between one and minus one. So I'm just adding and subtracting one from my central frequency. And again, my ears are not so good that I can hear a difference of, you know, one in a frequency. So maybe I can try to increase this range, increase the, uh, the depth of my vibrato. Right, and I can do this by creating a multiplication operator. So just asterisk tilde, and then let's say initially this should be one. But then I can put in an integer number box. And let's say instead of uh, going between minus one and plus one, I multiply the outgoing value by 10. So now it is a range of minus 10 to plus 10. And that is what I'm adding to the signal containing my frequency. So check this out. And if I increase this number, this is only going to get much more deeper. What we have created right here, in fact, is a very rudimentary form of an LFO. That might be something you heard before. Maybe you are very knowledgeable in LFOs, but LFO stands for low frequency oscillator. And it is pretty much using such oscillators, not for making sound, but for modulating certain parameters of a synth. Now, now that I got the depth of the vibrato down, I also want to change the speed of the vibrato. And I can do this simply by changing the frequency of my sine wave, changing the frequency of my cycle. So I'm going to create another integer number box. I'm going to plug this here. And now if I type in, for example, let's say 10, it should sound something like this.
And again, I can change this in real time. You can already see the effect it has on the sound wave through our live that scope. It's a bit of an annoying sound, but it opens an entire new world of possibilities. Before exploring this a bit further, let's take these CTLN objects that has that are mapped to our other knobs. Let's bring them all the way over here and plug these guys. In. But of course, before we have to scale these, right? So let's say I want the second knob to control the speed of the vibrato, but of course I don't want to go all the way up to 127. You might have noticed, but after a certain while it just sounds all the same and it's a very harsh, very fast vibrato, it's kind of oscillating on its own. So I'm again going to use scale between 0 and 127 and I want to scale it to 0 to let's say 10. Let's be a bit conservative. And I'm going to do the same thing for here. Uh, let's scale it from 0 to 127 to, let's say, until 25. So it can have a depth of 25 hertz. Okay, so now I should be able to modulate these. Awesome. There are so many cool things you can do with such a vibrato and as you might know traditionally this kind of effect is used uh, you know, as a part of the modulation wheel. Uh, maybe that's something we can get to in one of the future videos but this should give you an idea on how to take knobs uh, of a MIDI controller and apply it on synths and also you know add vibrato and other kinds of cool effects to a single oscillator. Well, there you have it. We have created and perfected our monophonic sense. So obviously the next step is to make it polyphonic. So we're going to add the next two oscillators in the following video. We're going to add a second rectangular oscillator and then a triangular oscillator, all following the NES sound chip model. Until then, thank you for watching.